Hey Knights, so this is chapter 4 to 6 of the Mermaid's Curse. So chapter 4, Kick. Apparently the cave system ran deeper than initially expected, for they found themselves scaling deeper into the ground for three days before finally making the ascent to the surface. The company had gone nearly four days without any issue other than Thorn sulking more than usual, having to endure a shorter temper and a sharper tongue. Amara was the only one who didn't feel the wrath of Thorn, choosing to communicate with every other member of the company except him. She seemed to be thoroughly enjoying herself, though, totally indulging in the luxury of having people to finally talk to. She wasn't used to having guests, so, re so revealed in, in their company and tried to converse with them as much as possible. She would even wake Balfour in the middle of the night just to talk to him, begging him to tell her more about toys. She had even tried to get Bilbo to describe to her the color pink and what an apple looked like, and if you could get pink apples in, why not? The company had finally settled down for the night, all except their leader, who was sitting furthest away from the water, unable to sleep and busy himself with his sword and wet stone. This was a ritual he'd taken to doing every night, especially now with these caves he seemed to render himself him sleepless. What bothers you so? A quiet, a quiet soft voice broke the silence. And through the dim light of the dying fire, Thorin could see the half-breed gently cleaning against the rock on which the company had retired. Her head was tilted slightly, her glistening hair dancing on the firelight, and her eyes were as large as ever. Nothing, he replied more gruffly than intended. Amara frowned her brow and toned a slight pet. Oh? She scooted closer to him, leaning further on the rock. It doesn't feel like nothing. It was Thorin's turn to look puzzled, and he lowered his sword into whetstone. He was about to ask what she meant, but she interrupted him. What's that? Her gold orbs flickered to the whetstone. It hadn't taken long for him to realize she had a short attention span, but she seemed to have the world's largest temper temperament. Nothing seemed to bother her. She was the definition of breezy. It's a whetstone. What's that? What does it do? Amara's point of view. For the past few days, I had tried to steer clear of Thorn, especially most of my time gravitating around Bilbo and Balfour. And especially Biffer, who was my favorite. Whenever I came near Thorn, it felt as though someone threw a dry blanket over me. A storm cloud hung over his head, and the air around him was filled with negativity. But not like doom and gloom, more anxiety, pressure, and tension. He never relaxed, constantly on the edge. To him, there is no silver lining in anything. I had approached him with hesitation, but something enticed me. I was curious to get to the bottom of his pain. I wanted to help him, like before. It's a filing stone. It sharpens weaponry. weaponry. He picked up his sword and stone again and continued his long, swift movements, avoiding eye contact. Can it sharpen my sword? Yes. Can you sharpen my sword? He finally looked up at me, his gray eyes shining like silver in the firelight. Wordlessly, he put down his own sword and held out a hand. I blinked at him and recoiled slightly, feeling uneasy about getting out of the water again. Getting out of the water again. I had done it just that once to sit next to before. But I knew I was safe with him. Thorin, on the other hand. I won't hurt you. His voice was low and sincere. His unblinking eyes bore into me. I fidgeted for a moment. Can't you come here? No. He withdrew his hand and went to pick up his sword again. Obviously, that was non-negotiable. Without a second thought, I pushed myself silently from the water and perched on the edge of the stone. I lifted my gaze and met his. His eyes looked me up and down. And for the first time in my life, I felt self-conscious. An unfamiliar feeling building in my stomach. It made me want to physically squirm with discomfort. My face grayly gray, uncommonly hot, and I grew uncommonly hot, and I gulped, extending my hand for some help. He blinked at my hand for a moment, seemingly taken aback to my complying. But then slowly, he reached for me and wrapped his large fingers around my small wrist. His hand engulfed mine, and he gently pulled me towards him. I was pleasantly surprised to find how calm he suddenly felt, and how smooth he was with me. He held my wrist as if it were made of glass, and with a little wriggling on my part, we sat side by side, rather awkwardly, about a foot between us. He avoided eye contact and sat rather stiffly. I just assumed it was because I had a tail and he was curious. Without even asking, he unceased my sword, clearing his throat, and began rubbing the stone against it. I peered at him slightly. He was obviously trying to avoid my presence, or conversation, or both. How did you know that stone would sharpen and not scratch the metal? I finally asked. It is a tool passed down from generations. His voice was flat and distant. Everyone knows. I didn't. I blinked at him, a familiar sinking feeling coming over me. 
a feeling I had grown to recognize over the past few days, whenever someone would mention something so menial to them, but completely new and intriguing to me. It was a harsh reminder of a world I would never know. Why are you helping us? His question was abrupt and sudden, and it would have caught me off guard if it wasn't half expecting it. I thought for a moment. Why should I not? Because you're a mermaid. His voice was turning bitter now, and he had started striking the whetstone against my sword more roughly and with more force, clearly channeling his grudge into it. I raised my, my, I raised my brow. What? So? I wasn't catching on or following. Sirens of the sea, man-eating and malevolent? We, we are? I blinked at him, slightly alarmed. He was now attacking my sword with the whetstone, sending sparks flying. Well, I apologize, but I truly have no desire to eat any of you. You all smell and are hardly appetizing anyway. I do not trust you, he said clearly. He had clearly been bottling this up for a few days now, his true feelings coming out with every strike against my sword. I know. Then why help us? He hissed at me, slamming the whetstone down and finally turning to me, glaring maliciously. That's when I saw it, just a flicker of clear visibility, sickness. It disappeared the same way it appeared, quickly. It did not leave a trace on his face either. It was clearly a tension he was hiding. My expression softened. Stop tormenting yourself, I replied briskly, staring dead into his eyes. I have no desire to eat any of you. I have no wish to corrupt or lead any of you astray. I simply wish to help because you need it. I know nothing of my kin or any of their ways. The only thing I am sure of is that I will live and die in these caves. What use am I? What purpose do I have? I wish to help you because you clearly do, all of you. You all have the chance to live how I cannot. Why would I stand in the way of that? His expression softened, but he still showed no weakness. Only tension. You remind me of a hazelnut, I exclaimed after a minute minute silence in which he just stared at me. A what? It's a type of water nut. Technically it's a seed, but it's called a hazelnut, and get on with it, he grunted, clearly insulted. I rolled my eyes and continued. It's got a thick, woody shell, and it takes a good hard throw or two against a wall to crack one. But when you do, it's got this yummy, gooey center. He gave me a sour look. What are you saying? I gave him a playful elbow, not that he looked as though he appreciated it. I'm saying you're not all bad. You have a big heart, you just don't want to show it. It's okay to be afraid. I'm not afraid, he replied bluntly, taking up my sword on the whetstone again and using it as an excuse to avoid eye contact. You are. There's nothing wrong with that. Are you afraid? What have I got to be afraid of? Those creatures that lurk in the water, the death cut that comes with them. He glanced at me, watching for a reaction, but he got none. I do not fear death. You don't? Why not? He raised a heavy brow, but still refusing to meet my eyes. I shook my head, now smiling softly. Because I know that when I die, I'll go home. I knew he didn't understand what I meant, and he opened his mouth to reply, but was cut off by an ear-piercing screech. Within an instant, everyone woke up and started shouting and gathering their things. I just blinked for a moment, trying to mentally catch up with them all. What was that? Ori shouted through the chaos, looking directly at me as I wiggled back to the water. Water drawers, and they sound angry, and... I was cut off by Keely and Feely coming up behind me, giving me a push, and with a noise of surprise, they rolled me over the edge of the rocks and into the water. When I broke the surface again, the company had formed a circle, ready to attack any creature that came their way. The shrieks grew louder, and I gulped. Something was wrong. Something was very wrong. Which way? Gandalf called towards me, noticing my frozen stance. For once, I was scared. Not for myself, but for the others. Never had I cared about anyone before. Never had I needed to, and it was strange. This way, I leapt into motion with a flick of my tail. Normal point of view. The company chased after the half-breed, following her soft glow and her occasional tail flick. Her tail fins were long and thin, and it wasn't until that Thorne noticed there was a small chunk missing from her left flipper, almost like a tear. He hated to think how she occurred that injury. The thought made his grip, him grip his sword so hard his knuckles turned white. She seemed so, she seemed too selfless and sweet to be allowed to obtain energy, injuries. He grunted at this thought and pushed it aside. He didn't trust her. He couldn't. He wouldn't let himself. The cave tunnel snaked and twisted so much, Thorin was sure they were lost. He couldn't tell one slime-covered wall from the next, and the splashing of their feet in the water must only be giving away their location. The shrieks only grew louder, and panic began to spread through the company. At all times, Thorin kept one eye on the half-breed, his trust in her flip-flopping. They ran for what felt like hours, but it was surely nowhere near that. The cave seemed to suck the perception of time out of the air. Suddenly, Amara stopped and broke the surface of the water with one of her strange noises. Not this way, she yelled, turning and heading straight back into the water and starting off in the other direction. Before she went back underneath the surface, Thorin caught sight of her eyes, and what were usually alarming orbs of bright gold had turned totally black. 
Something caught on Thorin's throat. A realization that she was in fact the hunter that he had feared. She was the monster that hunted sailors' dreams. Quick, her teeth flashed, her fangs more prominent than usual. But she was trying to help them. They had a vicious predator on their side, for once. The company then saw what she had turned from, the forbidding ripple that they knew all too well. Run, Thorn bellowed, and they were off again, chasing after the half-breed, again in a whirlwind of testosterone, te adrenaline and fear as if the li their life depended on it, which it did. Amara was on the left of the path, without warning, jumped across their path to take a sharp right. They followed, skidding and sliding everywhere. Gandalf and Bilbo were at the front, and Keely and Feely held up the rear. Keely stopped, loaded his bow, and aimed to shoot at one of the creatures that was beginning to grow dangerously close. But a narrow, another arrow beat him to it. One of Culbert Blue came whizzing past his ear and struck the creature right in the eye, as it made a leap for him. Keely turned just in time to see Amara fall back into the water, with not so much as even a ripple. They kept running, and by the slight incline in the flow of the water, they knew they were slowly going upwards, towards the surface, towards freedom, from these ghastly caves at least. There were two more lefts, a right, another left, three rights, and then... Light! I can see an exit, Bilbo cried, totally exhausted, and suddenly making a break for it. The rest of the company yelled in appreciation, all picking up speed. The light grew brighter and brighter. One more right turn, and there it was, the exit. The morning sun was just rising, casting a welcoming pinky-yellow hue in the cave. The dwarves didn't even notice the water had stopped. Suddenly, there was a loud scream and a splash. Keely and Feely teen turned to see Amara struggling against one of her creatures. She let out an ear-piercing scream when the creature bore its yellow teeth and closed them around the milky skin on her arm. Using its new grip to begin dragging her away. In the distance, more cave dwellers were advancing on them, and fast. Keely and Feely showed her look before sprinting towards the half ring. Keely grabbed her by her free arm, and Feely bringing his sword down on the creature's head before helping his brother with pulling Amara from the water. They had just freed her when another cave dweller grabbed for her. Its long talon-like fingers curled around the end of her tail, another joining, and then another. Amara screamed as a tug of war pursued. Feely was about to let go and unsheath his sword when suddenly Amara kicked out. Somehow, she slipped from the cave dweller's grip and kicked some more, hitting one straight in the end, gave Keely just enough time to swing Amara up and into his arms, fleeing from the cave with those creatures snapping at their heels. Chapter 5. Socks and Flowers at first, Feely and Keely didn't exactly notice that anything was wrong once they left the caves. The two siblings just grinned, and grinned at each other, full to the brim with pride that they'd made it with the murder made safely intact in Keely's arms. Satisfaction overwhelmed them, which is when they looked to the others, expecting them to chuck also. But they didn't. The rest of the company stared wordlessly in the quivering female in Keely's arm. It was a modern right? even though her face was hidden beneath Keely's coat, there is no mistake the castate of golden wet hair. Her skin, however, did not have its usual golden hue, and had turned a sickly green in color. Most of all, which started Keely so much he nearly dropped the girl, was that her bottom half was no longer a parade of golden scales and fins, but instead a pair of slim, smooth, slightly green legs. She whimpered from under Keely's coat, clearly in pain. Her open wound was still bleeding, although not particularly heavy, but her blood was a pale turquoise in color. Thorin's gaze drifted from Feely to Keely, then back to the trembling mermaid, if you could still call her that, and remained silent, but the siblings read Thorin's look. Those creatures got her. We couldn't just leave her, Keely mumbled, not making eye contact with his uncle. Another whimper came from the bundle of green and gold in his arms. She was soaking wet, cold, and every clearly distressed. Thorin did not say a word for quite some time. His thoughts and emotion were in utter turmoil. When he finally spoke, his words were surprisingly hoarse. His voice was surprisingly hoarse. Can she walk? Keely looked down at the female and gave her a gentle squeeze, and then a light shake in an attempt to get her attention. She peeked out his coat and caught sight of her new limbs. Clearly, by her following actions, she didn't know but she did know they were there. Aye! She propelled herself from Keely in a whirlwind of water and hair, landing on the ground with a hard thud. She obviously was not she was obviously not as graceful on land as she was on water, and gawked at her legs, which lay awkwardly sprawled out in front of her. She wiggled her toes and made a noise of surprise. Can you walk, lass? Barford tried, becoming forward, coming forward gently and crouching to her level. Everyone was silent and watched intently as the girl looked at him with large, round eyes. She sniffed in response, wiggled her nose before grabbing one of her feet and pulling it to her face for closer inspection. She had never seen toes before. Of course, she had seen legs, but toes? She lost balance and toppled over. 
It was Poffer's turn now, and he didn't take such a soft approach. He simply strode over to the confused girl, and one swift moment movement posted her up. He held her arms to steady her as her newfoundly formed knees wobbled slightly. Thorn couldn't help but think she looked like a baby deer taking its first steps. Her large golden eyes begged for comfort, and her bare, totally hairless legs shook under her weight. Her normal coloring had to, her normal coloring had returned now, and in the rising sun, her skin glowed a soft gold. Her hair kept catching the light, and although still slightly damp, it glistened. Thorin watched her face. She wasn't like a Dorman woman, that's for sure, although she was surprisingly small, standing maybe an inch taller than the Hobbit did. But she had always been petite. Her hands had been swallowed by his when he held them only that night before. Her face was soft, the only hair on it being a pair of beautifully arched eyebrows and long, thick lashes. Her nose was like a little tomato, cute as a button, and her jaw was smooth, completely polar to the sharp, square jaw of female dwarves, if ever visible from under their beards. Her lips were not as bright, not a bright red, and her cheeks were not rosy either. Instead, her lips were full and a pinky peach in color, and her cheeks were being a soft, dusty pink. But it was those large eyes that made her so alluring, and Thorn found himself understanding why, so, why sailors would pursue such a creature. She was so innocent and untainted by the horrors of the outside world. But she was also strong, brave, and had a heart of gold. He finally admitted it. His first impression was wrong. Thorn Oakenshield had been wrong. Thorn? Uncle? Thorn's train of thought abruptly crashed, and he quickly brought himself out of his thoughts. Realizing he had been staring at Amara, he cleared his throat. Yes, he scowled at Feely, and the amused look he was bearing. He had caught him staring. Feely nodded towards Amara, who thankfully hadn't noticed his gaze. She was too preoccupied with wobbling over to Bafar and Bofer, who now stood a few yards away from her, arms outstretched and wearing hugely encouraging grins. The hobbit trailed behind her, arms ready if she fell. Thorin smiled himself, fi Thorin smiled, finding himself remember when he and his sisters were teaching Feely and Keely to walk. She's getting there, Thorin responded flatly, turning away and looking at the orange sky. We should rest here for a few hours, get some sleep and food, and then we head on. He glanced over his shoulder at the older prince and then at Amara, who had fallen over onto the hobbit. Obviously, he had spoken too soon. Make sure she's fit to travel. I'm sure we can find a place for her to stay along our journey. Feely raised an eyebrow. Are you just going to leave her somewhere? He glanced at the girl. We can't just abandon her. Thorn was about to respond when the wizard piped up, seemingly finally having an input. I know a place not too far from here where she would be most welcome. Thorne nodded, thankful for once the wizard had seen reason with him, and turned back to his nephew to face him fully. She shouldn't come with us. She has never even walked before. She will be a burden. He glanced back at Amara again, taking note of her attire. She donned only a long, worn, shabby tunic. Plus, she is hardly dressed for travel. Find her something, would you? He then turned away, trying to find an appropriate spot in which to rest. Once seated next to Balin, his gaze fell on Amara again who was still on the ground, staring at Kiwi, who was waving a pair of socks on her face. You're, to you're really going to just leave the last somewhere? Balin spoke softly, barely above a whisper. I, Thorin replied gruffly. When we reclaim Erebor, I will send for her. Balin chuckled at this, his beard bouncing as he did so. Good thinking. I don't think Pepper would be too impressed if he didn't. Thorin nearly smiled, watching the strange dwarf attempt to put socks on Amara, who wouldn't stop squirming and recoiling. Of course, he hadn't been... You haven't even thought about Buffer. The particular dwarf wasn't the reason why he wanted her to return to them. Thorn didn't realize he had fallen asleep, and he didn't know for how, how long for. But when he did wake up, the sun was fully up. He sat up and stretched. You're awake. Thorn, look what I can do. Look, are you looking? Amara was standing a few feet away from him, grinning from ear to ear, pot and positively glowing. In the background, he saw Buffer and Bull, Bifor and Balfour asleep side by side. Seemingly, she was the only one awake and had been practicing her walking, for she confidently strode towards him. She closed the gap between them and smiled proudly. Very good. He avoided eye contact with her. Thorne had never seen her dry before. Her hair was, was thick and fell in soft waves to her waist, and curling towards the end. In the new sunlight, it sparkled even more than usual. Her tunic was also dry and no longer clung to her, which he was very thankful of. Amara grinned widened. For some reason, she wanted to show Thorne the most. She wanted his approval the most. Maybe it was because he had to, to maybe it was because he had to please and was and so when he was it was more of an achievement. 
What she didn't expect, though, was that when he did praise her, something warm flooded her belly. From her position, she looked down at him. He, however, was not looking at her, and down towards his nephew, who lay near his feet. Do you like my clothes? She wasn't... He wanted his attention again. Finally, he looked up at her. It was, if only for a moment, and his silver, stormy eyes met hers before looking her up and down. She was wearing Ori's spare trousers and Keely's socks. The trousers were clearly Maz too big for her and pulled up to her waist. They were only held there by a piece of discolored rope which had been tied around her twice. She wore no shoes because they had none going. Thorn frowned. What? Something in Amira's chest felt heavy. Did he not like it? Did she disappoint him? When Thorn turned away again to rummage through his pack, she frowned. Take these. He put a match through another pair of socks at her, which she quickly caught. We may be traveling on rough terrain, and you need all the protection you can get. Are you cold? What? She was busy, busy pulling on at the socks, which were knotted tightly together. Together tightly. Cold. Are you cold? A little, I suppose, but... Thorn cut her off by pulling out a royal blue jumper from his pack and handing it, up, holding it out for her. Gratefully, she took it and pulled it on without hesitation. It completely swamped her, falling nearly to her knees, and the sleeves fell over her hands by a good few inches and dwarfed, and dwarfed her even further. Thorn finally stood and began rolling up her sleeves without a second thought, or at least trying not to think. He couldn't help but notice when his fingers brushed her soft skin that she was so that she was so cold, and that her skin didn't actually feel like skin. You're so warm, Amara said through the silence, shuffling close to him slightly, and seeing no wrong in doing so. Something caught in Thorne's throat, and he didn't reply, only stiffened out of awkwardness. Put those socks on. We leave soon. He grunted finally, and then and made to leave to wake his wet nephews. Um, could you help me? Thorne had his back to the girl now, and he shut his eyes in exasperation when she asked. He couldn't physically say no to her, yet at the same time he didn't want to be near her. She still gave him that unearthly feeling of an ease in the pit of his stomach. Slowly, he turned, and with a heavy sigh, he nodded. Amara grinned at him and held the socks out for him to take. Thank you, she squeaked when he bent down to help her. He may have pulled up her leg rather too roughly, for she made a noise and grabbed his shoulders to steady herself. Her trite grip on, her, on his coat made it slightly harder to concentrate at the task at hand. Which, it was just that, a task. Getting a pair of socks on her tiny feet was a battle all of its own. She wobbled and squeaked at him. Whatever is the matter, he groaned, quickly pulling up the first sock, having finally put it over her heel. He wanted to get this over and done with. Their close proximity was making his stomach feel trouble. She made, made another strange noise, and he found himself glancing up at her, recognizing the noise to be one she would make if she was in discomfort. It feels funny. How so? It makes me... She wiggled around and squirmed slightly, a small smile now playing at her lips. Does it tickle? Thorne mused out loud, his eyes twinkling. Amaro looked at him. What's that? Does it make you want to laugh? There's almost a chuckle in his voice, his gray eyes dancing with amusement. Amara had never seen Thorne remotely amused before, and although it was strange, she liked it. Something warm bubbled in her stomach at the realization that it was her that made him amused. A bit, she replied sheepishly. Then, without warning and without thinking on Thorne's part, he moved his fingers quickly against the sole of her feet. Amara hooted with laughter, and the abrupt feeling made her lose balance. She fell on the floor in front of Thorne with a thud. Amara looked up, still giggling, at the tingling that was lingering on her foot. Thorne was trickling at her, and there was a small smile behind his beard. She grinned at him, admiring the way he looked. There was something about him that made her look twice. He was indeed handsome, although in a disheveled way, maybe. Amara assumed there was simply that was simply from his travels, though. He was strong, protective, and brave, and feeling of importance seemed to radiate from him. He held his own and was very good at it. His eyes were sparkling, and his nose was sharp. His black hair was thick, and the silver streaks that laced it gave him a look of wisdom, of hard times in recovery. You should do that more often, she said to him quietly. Do what? He was still giving her a small smile when he went back to pulling the final, pulling up her phylum sock. Smiling, of course. It suits you. His smile fell, and he glanced at her. her his eyebrow raised questionably. It makes you look handsome. Amaro's point of view. I was trying to be sincere and comforting. But by the look of it, I had done the opposite, for I had never seen anyone look so uncomfortable. Thorne hastily stood up, gaining composure fast. I blinked at him for a response, but I got none. He simply stared and moved away. I watched him walk, a strange pulling in my chest. I found him very admirable. Something in his past haunted him greatly. I knew that much, but he hid it well and only desired best for his kin. He may seem hard and cold on the outside, but I knew that I w that was just a wall put in place to protect himself. 
On the inside, I knew he was gooey, or at least that he could be with a little melting. I watched him wander around the group, waking up the rest of the company rather harshly, with a kick here and a prod there. I just hoped he wouldn't make me up like that. I began to play with grass I was sitting on. Come on, lass. It was Boffer. He was smiling down at me, which, with his hand extended. Time to go. Where are we going? I asked, gratefully taking his hand and letting him help me to my feet. Although I was very skilled walker now, thank you very much, I couldn't do much else. He laced his arms through mine as we walked, mainly for support. Boffer glanced at me, heading, handing me my bow, quiver, and sword before shrugging. East was his reply. I opened my, ass, my mouth to ask what was East that interested them, so when Bilbo appeared to my left, his hands full of brightly colored flowers, I grinned excitedly. My previous thoughts of inquiry evaporated from my mind. For you, Bilbo smiled and extended them towards me. I eagerly took them. Which one's pink? This one. Bilbo pointed at the most beautiful one, and I squeaked with delight. What types are they? And that's how our afternoon pursued. Bilbo enlightened me about all the flowers he could think of. He told me what a bumblebee was when I pointed to one. He told me what a butterfly was when I tried to grab one. Thorn hadn't completely slipped from my mind, though, and I, was, I kept stealing glances his way. He was walking a fair bit ahead of me, seemingly in deep conversation with Valor. I wanted to go talk to him. I wanted to give him a flower and share with him the knowledge I had just gained. But I didn't. I kept my mouth shut and listened to Bilbo and toyed with the flowers in my hand, occasionally bringing them up to my nose and smelling them. It was quite late when we stopped for the night. Apparently, Thorne wanted to make up for the time we'd lost that morning. He said that for some reason, they were journeying, 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 I can't talk. They were journeying at a slower pace that usually, than usual, and they must make up for that. Even though Gandalf had assured him our next destination was only half a day's walk away. Well, now it's even less, Thorne had responded pointedly, and I'm sure I caught Gil Gal Gandalf rolling his eyes. But, nevertheless, we had now stopped, and my hands, which were once filled with flowers, were now empty. All the flowers now being tied neatly into my hair, courtesy of the Thorne. I was about to take a seat when I noticed feeling keenly and realized I hadn't even thanked them for saving me, so I made my way over to them. They smiled at me as I approached. I just wanted to thank you for saving me. It was truly very kind of you. I grinned at the pair, and I meant it. I'd never known such kindness. I've never even believed in anyone who would risk their lives for another. Sure, I wanted to help them back in the caves, but I'd never expected them to return the favor. The gesture made my heart swell with joy, and I knew exactly how to thank them. It was nothing, replied Keeley, clearly cajoled and sporting a boastful smirk. Don't mention it, Feely agreed, seeming less flustered, but just as proud. They both inclined their heads to me, and I pulled them into a joint hug before placing a soft kiss on each of their temples. I smiled and pulled away, my eyes lingering where their skin glistened for a few moments before returning back to normal. Feely and Keeley stood awkwardly as I walked away, seemingly taken back by, by, by my forwardness. I found a seat between Balfour and Bilbo. Bilbo and watched with unease as Donald lit a fire. I didn't like that. I didn't like anything that wasn't wet. I rubbed my arm absently at the discomfort that had formed there. I hated being dry. Absolutely despised it. And I couldn't sense any water near. It made me uncomfortable and agitated, which is why I was itching. I knew my skin was beginning to peel. Normal point of view. Thorn watched the half-breed scratch at her arm roughly, and he frowned. He didn't know much about mermaids. If anything at all, bearing in mind, his previous perceptions on them had turned out to be totally false and was abruptly squashed. But if there is one thing he knew, it was that they liked water. And he doubted that she had ever been fully out of water for such a long period of time. He couldn't help but wonder if this was the source of her agitation. He had been shooting glances at her all day to check and make sure she was still all right. He quickly learned that she was thoroughly amusing to watch. Her attention span appeared to be short and her mind moved fast. She marveled at everything, and he was pretty sure she picked the whole of Middle Earth clean of flowers. It was highly amusing watching the hobbit trying to keep up with the fast-paced half-breed. As the evening unfolded, Amara found herself beginning to get rather upset. Now they had stopped, and her now they had stopped, and her mind was no longer preoccupied with the heavy task of walking and learning. She was growing acutely aware of her discomfort, although extremely grateful for Phoebe and Keeley's life-saving heroics. She soon realized how much she seemed to lack. While everyone laid on their bedrolls in furs, she could only sit, bring her knees to her chest, and pull Thorne's jumper over them like a little ball for warmth, for she refused to venture anywhere near the demon fire. She also missed the comfort of her hairbrush, and she found herself using her fingertips as 
her fingers as a comb in an attempt to tame her flowing threads. Usually, Thorn was rather haughty and did not notice anyone else's conditions outside of his kin. But he watched Amora fold herself into a ball and frown. The entire evening, keeping one eye on her to make sure she didn't get too full. He had watched rather longingly as she ran her fingers through her hair. In the fairy light, it glistened as it looked so soft and smooth. He almost twitched in, in temptation to touch. Dwellin, you take first watch, Thorn announced, noticing the rest of the company was beginning to retire. Amara had fallen asleep hours ago, though, and none of the company could blame her, and therefore let her be. She must be truly exhausted after the eventful day they just had. All in one day, Amara had been bitten, pulled into the outside world with nothing but her tunic on her back, learned to walk, although her speed was rather limited, and had slowed them down, spent the day being taught about agriculture, alongside many other things, and never uttered a word of complaint. She may seem innocent and untainted by the world, but she was far from weak. Thorn was quite impressed with her. She was either extremely dedicated and hardy, or extremely stubborn. Darlin nodded and stood, having a small stretch before making his way over to his post. Then you, Phoebe, and I'll take the rest of the night after that, he concluded, glancing at his nephew to see his acknowledgement before taking his bedroll. But his night was spent far from relaxing. Chapter 6 In Miladaris Thorn stood in the main entrance of Erebor. In the background, his large stone throne sat tall and overlooking his kingdom. Upon his head sat what his grandfather, what was his grandfather's throne, crown, to symbolize that he was now the king of Erebor. He wore robes of royal blue and crusted with gems that sparkled under his coat with thick black furs, and a belt that shone in the light of the mountain halls. He seemed to be in deep conversation with Thiele, who also wore a crown of smaller grandness. Look what I made, my boys, a voice called that sounded oddly familiar, but somehow different. There was that familiar playfulness, but it was also unusually grateful. Both Thorn and Feely turned to see Amara come sashaying out from around a mighty stone pillar, her hips swaying as she walked elegantly toward them, a small but brazen smile pulling at her lips, and a plate balanced effortlessly in her left hand. Dream Thorn grinned at her as she glided toward them, her heavy, red, lightly jeweled dress swinging, and the white furs of her coat giving her a hearty appearance. Her hair was half pulled back on her face and braided the same way Thorne's hair was with a large silver clasp at the back, and the two smaller braids starting behind her ears and ending with two silver beads at the end. What is it? Feely asked curiously as she closed the gap between them, standing before them and holding out the plate. I believe they are called profiteries. She grinned at them, wafting the, <coughs> the round plate in front of them. She held them out to Dream Thorn first and raised her perfectly shaded brows at him expectantly. He took one and popped it into his mouth, humming in appreciation when the pastry popped and thick cream filled his mouth. They're good, he told his nephew, licking his lips, and Amara handed Feely the plate before taking a few steps closer to Thorn. She wrapped her arms around his waist and leaned against him, her head on his chest. Dream Thorn wrapped his arms around her and kissed her hair. To Nolamet M, she mumbled, the words rolling from her lips in a melodic fashion, and rubbed her head against him affectionately. She then looked up, her large golden eyes meeting his. Dreamthorn seemed to understand what her magical words meant, for he smiled to kiss, for he smiled and kissed her forehead, then her button nose, and then finally meeting her lips with his wobblingly. Thorn woke with a start, choking on his anxiety, and eyes wide with alarm. His heart was beating uncomfortably fast, so he thumped his fist against his chest to ease the pounding. Are you all right, Thorn? Feely asked, peering at him with concern. It was still dark and seemingly hours away from dawn, with Feely still on his turn of watch. Yes, strange dream, he answered briskly. He couldn't bring himself to say it was a nightmare, for it wasn't. Feely simply nodded, but didn't look convinced. Take rest, Thorn told him, his voice low to not wake the rest of the company. His eyes desperate to search for the half-breed. I'll take it from here. Feely didn't need to be told twice, and he nodded, sending his uncle a small smile as he stood and began to make his way over to where his bedroll was next to Healy. Thorne's eyes followed him as he passed Amara. She was curled into a tight ball, and as Feely stepped over her, she made one of her noises. Feely smirked as Thorne frowned. Strange little thing, isn't she? Feely said, drop, stopping to peer at her. She's cold, Thorne replied instinctively, taking off his coat and throwing it to Feely. His nephew shot him a questionably look as he caught it. Cover her. What? How do you know? That noise, it means she's cold. He had noticed her making the same noise earlier that day, and also a few nights ago in the caves when she joined them for supper. For some reason, she refused to go near the fire, and then wondered why she got cold. However, she only seemed to get cold in the open air. 
in the water, which in those caves are positively icy. She seemed perfectly fine. Feely raised his eyebrows in, in pleasant surprise. Eyes filled with amusement. You know that means she... You know that noise means she's cold? He carefully laid the coat over her. Almost instantly, she tightened it around herself, snuggling into the furs. She made another noise, this one slightly higher in pitch. Feely shot Thorin another questioning look, wordlessly asking what the noise meant. She's happy now, Thorin answered, settling himself against a tree trunk to take the next watch and avoid his eldest nephew's gaze. Feely's eyes twinkled as he watched his uncle rush off the caring incident. Are you going to sleep, or am I wasting my time taking the rest of your watch? Thorin snapped at Feely, glancing at him and narrowing his eyes at the amused look on the elder prince's face. Without another word, Feely went to his bedroll, still highly entertained, and revealing in his uncle's newfound fondness for the female, and his apparent blindness to it. However, Thorn was beginning to stew over his actions. The night passed too quickly for Thorn. He barely noticed the lighting of the sky and the orange sun rising. He was too lost in his thoughts and his dream. It made him uneasy just how much he wanted to continue the dream. He couldn't help but be curious to what happened next, or even how he got there. It was not uncommon for him to dream of being king of Erinborg. He often dreamt of the day he'd slay the beast that lay in the gold of the mountains and reclaimed his rightful place on the throne. But, in all those years, a woman has never been in his dreams. At least, not like that. His musing raised a few questions, including the rather protruding one of, did he want that? No, of course not. His action towards her are simple. She is a female, and his mother, like any dwarf, taught him to treat women with respect, to look after them and protect them. That's why he gave her his coat, he told himself. His mother raised him to be a gentleman. No matter how uneasy the half-breed made him feel, she was a female. And therefore, he would treat her like wood. It was his duty, as a male, a dwarf, a duran, and a king to show the female manners. It was common courtesy. She had also saved them, helped them, and protected them herself. He was only returning the favor. That was it. It had nothing to do with fondness at all. Maybe someday he would take a queen, but that was a long way off. He never thought about it back in the Blue Mountains. Indeed, he would had women showing interest in him, but it had never been mutual. He'd been too busy with plans to reclaim his homeland to settle down. His thoughts made him nervous, for it does not take that long for a dwarf to fall in love, and when they do, there is no choice, nor is there any going back. Once a dwarf has found their one, he or she will refuse any other, even if their one has already fallen in love with another. Because of this, the dwarves, dwarven race is slow growing and takes centuries to recover from large losses. For a dwarf, their hearts are not connected to their brains. There is no, not, there is not changing what the heart wants. Nor are there usually any warnings. In some ways, this is a weakness, and Thorin found himself praying to Mala that his heart wouldn't or wasn't choosing Mara. He glanced over at the half brain, her hair only just visible from under his coat. It glistened a rose gold in the rising sun, and it was covered in thousands of tiny diamonds, and it took him a lot of willpower not to go over to her and touch it. He remembered how it was braided in his dream, exactly like his, which was custom in dwarven courting to publicly proclaim publicly proclaim that two dwarves were a pair. He found himself staring a little, staring for a little longer than necessary, and quickly turned away. He'd only known her for a week or so, so there was no way he'd had any affection for the female. It was generally impossible. It was obviously merely a fa fascination, maybe at a push in attraction, for she was an alluring creature. But it was okay for him to find her attractive. It was only normal, for that was her design, as a mermaid, to be captivating. The way, the same way dwarves were designed to be hardy, mermaids were designed to be irresistible. That was it. That's all it was. This realization didn't bring him the peace of mind he desired, and instantly he slowly felt something thick fill in his stomach. A familiar unease, and as a result, his brow furled. He suddenly heard a squeak from behind him, and he abruptly turned right around just as Amara rolled over, tangling herself further into his coat. She made another noise. It was long and mel mel melodic, 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 mm. Melo I don't even know how to say that, that's awesome, and made his stomach buzz pleasantly. He quickly stood, taking this as a sign to wake everyone up. He no longer wanted to muse on his own, and now wanted to occupying. In a few strides, he headed for Nori first, kicking the dwarf awake. Nori grumbled, rolling on his front and peering at Thorin through the early morning sun. What time is it? He croaked, blinking his eyes open. It's still early. 
Indeed it was. The ground was still highly dewy, and the sun was barely up. But Thorn wanted to get going. So he gave a haughty, so what, and moved on. Next was Dory, who gave a similar, similar response to his kin. Then Belfer, Ori followed, then Bombor. Then he reached Amara. She was curled up tightly in his coat. It completely engulfed her. He squinted at her, not having the heart to harshly awaken her. Again, he was a gentleman, and it would be improper for him to simply kick her awake. He may feel uncomfortable and slightly nauseous in her presence, but she was still a lady, and his mother raised him to be a gentleman. So he reluctantly got down on his knees and gently, and rather awkwardly, poked her. Why does Amara get special treatment? He heard Keely mutter bitterly, having just woken up by Bomber jumping on him. Thorn just sent him a warning look. Turning back to her, Thorin shook her gently. After having no initial response from the poke, Amara, he almost cooed, which shocked himself. He wasn't aware that he was able to coo. Hopefully, no one noticed. It suddenly dawned on him how he had gotten himself here, and he didn't actually know. A week ago, he was cautious of her, wary of her, and somewhat reluctant for, of her help. And now, although still cautious and wary, but for different reasons, here he was on his knees, trying to carefully wake her. In the past few days, he'd seen how kind she was to the others. She was free-spirited and sociable, and he somehow, as a result, didn't have the heart to be anything but hospital back. She was warm to the rest of the company, and he realized that she was no longer a threat. She wasn't the creature he'd originally assumed she was, and this made him feel somewhat guilty. Amara mumbled something in a language he didn't understand, followed by a small noise that sounded a bit like a whistle. Thorn shook her again, then brushed a hair away from her face subsequently revealing her glistening skin and peachy cheeks. She instantly frowned and pulled his coat over her face in one movement, completely covering herself. Gee, came the chattering sound from under his coat. Thorn frowned, not understanding her language. Wake up, he ordered, and gently shook her again. So, Ro, came the response. What? So, Ro, gee. We need to leave. Ung, ye nee. She grunted at him and rolled over under his coat. I don't understand what you're saying. He was surprisingly calm, bearing in mind his lack of sleep and deceivable thoughts. But this, but this wonderful, wonderfully thoracic, erratic language was fascinating, let alone slightly humorous. She's saying no, and that she's cold. Thorn turned to see Bilbo peering at the covered mermaid from over his shoulder and shot him a hard, questioning look. Bilbo suddenly fidgeted nervously. She taught me some words yesterday. Thorin is a truly wonderful language. Thorin turned back to the bundle that was Amara and said, Keep my coat, it'll keep you warm. At his words, Amara poked her head out from under the furs. Her eyes were their usual size of dinner plates and brighter than the gold rings on his fingers. She blinked at him. Really? Her voice was small and sleepy. Thorin just gave her a stiff nod and stood. Come, we will be leaving soon. With that, he walked away. Amara blinked again, this time to wake herself up and stretch out. Her short legs not even poking out the end of the Thorin's coat. Suddenly, a shadow cast over her. It was Buffer holding out a bowl for her. She sat up and took it. What is it? She asked with a smile of appreciation and gave it a quick sniff. In response, Buffer grunted, and Amara understood, taking another sniff before awkwardly taking the spoon that Buffer was holding out to her in his other hand and tasting some. It was lumpy and watery and didn't have much flavor, but it was different. Amara had ne never had anything like it, and even though she didn't like it, she ate all of it and even licked the bowl out after her entire life, she'd eaten fish, weeds, and the occasional nut. But now look at her. She tried stew, brew, and now porridge. She grunted at Bofer when she finished and wiped her mouth with the back of her hand. Bofer returned her smile and took the bowl off her. She watched him walk away, talking merrily to himself. As she watched him out of the corner of her eye, she saw Thorn looking at her with an expression she didn't understand. They walked for the rest of the day, Amara still tightly wrapped up in Thorn's coat. The hand nearly drowning along the floor. Bilbo walked along beside her, telling her all about the different flavors of tea that he could think of, and what they tasted of, and how they were made, and what they originated from. But she wasn't paying attention. She was, she was too caught up in the soft furs of the collar. They were so soft, and she kept rubbing her cheeks on them, occasionally sneezing as a result. She loved the smell, too, of leather and smoke. Again, a scent that she was not used to, and she had to ask Bilbo to smell the collar to decipher it for her, which was a little awkward. She also found herself smiling when she thought about how the coat that smelled so good and kept on kept her warm was Thorin's. She had decided that she admired him. She didn't know how much emo didn't know much about emotions, feelings, or friendships, but she knew she admired Thorin. 
The way he walked with so much purpose, the way he talked with so much power, and the way that he poised himself was so impressive. Amara pulled the coat around her tighter and purred with pension, closing her eyes briefly. She hadn't noticed everyone had stopped until she walked into Dolan's back. She squeaked and lost balance, but quickly caught her. But he quickly caught her and pulled her to her feet in front of him. Amara gasped at what her eyes fell on. In Maladaris, she breathed, just as Bilbo came to stand beside her. At the same time, he murmured, Rivendell. Amara eyed the vast waterfalls and pools of water hungrily. She never seen such beautiful waters, crystal clear and gleaming in the sunlight. This was your plan all along, to lead us into the arms of our enemy? Thorne's booming voice pulled her head from her clouds, from the clouds, her attention now on him. He was staring at Gandalf, face burying in his eyes, fury burying in his eyes and poison dripping from his words. You have no enemies here, Thorne Oakenshield. The only ill will would be found in the val in this valley is that which you bring yourself. Gandalf scolded, glancing down at the dwarf with a warning look. Do you think the elves will give us give our quest their blessing? Thorne hissed in a low voice, but Amara's sharp ears caught every word. Above water, her eyesight may be bad, but her hearing was still superb. Quest? What quest? She went to take a step forward, but Dolan held her shoulders. Thorne merely glanced at Mara before turning back to the wizard, pointedly ignoring her and continuing. They will try to stop us. Of course they will, but we have questions that need to be answered. Thorne quickly, Thorne quite clearly clenched his jaw and held his tongue, not knowing how to reply. So Galden took, Gandalf took this as an opportunity to continue. If we are to be successful, this will need to be handled with tact and respect, and no small degree of charm, which is why you will leave the talking to me. With that, he began walk away towards eastern, the eastern house. A few of the doors hesitated and grumbled, but Amara and Bilbo raced after the wizard. You don't like elves? Amara asked Keely after a while of walking, who was a few paces behind her, somewhat sulking at the ideas of having to share the same air as the creatures. No, we don't, he replied crossly. Every step he took was more like a stump. Amara slowed her pace to walk beside him. Pray tell? Keely glanced at her, her large golden eyes filled with interest and questions. We lost our homeland, he being, began quietly, to a dragon. Diagara? Amara's eyes were wide with shock and just a hint of awe. A skyworm? I, Keely nodded, taking note of the strange word for the beast. Our people are left homeless and wandering, and the elves did, not, did nothing to help us. Amara frowned. That's not very nice, she muttered, more to herself than Keely. Keely started ungraciously. Indeed, they didn't help at all. They did nothing other than watch on tauntingly, Thorne's voice replied before Keely got a chance to. He was a few paces ahead of Amara now, and he didn't look back as he, as he spoke. Our people and I were left with nothing, no homes, no supplies, and nowhere to go. They did not support us when Smog came, nor any time after that. You were there? Amara hurried over to Thorne, who instantly braced himself for her presence. Yes, you saw the Digara? De and his wrath, he hissed bitterly, fists clenching at the memory that began racing through his mind. Omara noticed this, but didn't get a chance to pry any more, for she tripped on an awkwardly protruding stone on the rocky path and stumbled. When she finished tripping and found her bearings, Thorne had started off, shoulders square and back straight. Omara spent the rest of the journey sandwiched between Feely and Keely, listening intently to their stories of Erebor in the golden halls of their kin. It was another hour or so until they finally reached a narrow bridge that led to into River. Rivendell. Omara was relieved when the two princes took a hand each to lead her across. Her footing had improved vastly, but it would only take one slip for her to go tumbling over the side. Not that she was particularly minded, for below them was a long drop, then a great glistening pool. They had just reached a round open courtyard with a, when a tall, dark-haired elf appeared and began descending the smooth stone steps in front of them. Amara stared at him in awe. She'd never seen an elf before. But the men that used to use the caves as a pass spoke of them, their ways and their beauty. The elf literally floated towards them, arms open towards Gandalf. Mithril, he spoke kindly, his voice as light as sea foam. Gandalf returned the kind kindliness with a smile, reaching the elf and speaking with him quietly. The rest of the company stood awkwardly, barely conversing with one another. Amara, on the other hand, e either didn't notice or care. She was lost in thought and staring at a nearby waterfall. She quite literally jumped out of her skin when a horn sounded in the distance, and she instinctively grabbed a nearby hand for security and comfort. Close ranks, Thorin shouted as an assembly of elves and horses began to surround them. Without hesitation, he pushed Amara behind him. 
Still a tight grip on her small hand, and with his other hit, with his other, he raised his axe threateningly. Lamar stared in horror at the horses, having never, having never seen one before. The tall men dressed heavily in armor daunted her and made her feel even smaller. The elves continued to circle them tightly, and forcing the company closer together. Gandalf, one of the elves, spoke from his horse. In one swift movement, he studied and dismounted, going towards the wizard and embracing him. Though they also they also spoke briefly and once again ignored the company, before the elf stepped forward, his eyes on Thorn. Thorn released his grips on Amara's hand before taking a step forward, pushing out his chest as he did so to appear more intimidating. Welcome, Thorn, son of Thorin, the elf nodded courteously. I do not believe we have met, Thorn replied somewhat patently, trying not to speak through gritted teeth. The elf gave him a small smile. You have your grandfather's bearings. I knew Thor when he ruled under the mountain. Amara frowned, feeling like she was missing something. She didn't like being excluded. Indeed, he questioned. He made no mention of you. His words were bitter, fists clenched as the elf spoken about his kin in former kingdom so casually. In hindsight, he should have been more polite, bearing in mind he was about to ask for the help. He shuddered at the thought. In return, Lord Aldrin said something in Elvish, which resulted in the instant uproar from the company. What is he saying? Does he offer us insult? Glon demanded, already raising his weapon. No, Master Glon, he is offering you food, Gandalf clarified with a hint of exasperation in his voice. The elf beside him looked somewhat amused, until Amara peeked out from around Thorn. Then his expression turned momentarily into one of astonishment, before clearing it again. And maybe your Bowachi com companion a bath, Lord Enron exposed, spoke kindly, motioning to the, to the first elf to lead the way. Amara squeaked with joy and stumbled forward towards the elf, but Thorn grabbed her arm before she went any further, somewhat glaring at Lord Eldon. Do not worry, Master Oakenshield. She will be in safe hands. Thorn didn't reply, but he glanced at the half-breed who was watching him with pleading, desperate eyes. Slowly and reluctantly, Thorn let her go and watched with a furrowed brow, as she pretty much flew up the stairs after the younger elf, already chewing his ear off about the prospects of a bath. Okay, so that was the next three chapters. Yeah. Peace out, knights.